Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Ascension Podcast. I'm your host, Paul James Caden. And this week on the show, joining me is author Richard Rosen. And we are going to be talking about life after death as presented in the Arantia book. Richard is the author of quite a few books, uh, several of them being uh, Planetary, Angelic Planetary Management, Living Spiritually in a Practical World, and the one we're going to be talking about today, if I can get that on camera, which is Life After Death, an account of what comes next. So this is a, a, a little bit different. There's a lot of theories about what happens when we die. And uh, the Arantia book has a little bit of a different take, although uh, not completely different. We've heard scholars talk about this in the past, mainstream biblical scholars. So take us, uh, if you will, and uh, by the way, thank you for coming on the show today. And um, take us through the moment when a human being dies what happens next immediately they take their last breath what does the arantia book say what what happens after that paul thank you for having me on the show uh, i'm glad to share this knowledge because i have found that the fear of death is such an overriding impulse of people and decisions they make in their life that cause such havoc, such mayhem, such harm to themselves and to the loved ones also. I'm going to go into the detail about what happened, but first I want to present that the knowledge of what comes next makes this life so much easier because now you're deciding on life and death issues and even ordinary issues with a higher perspective because the larger your perspective, the easier life becomes. You're not making decisions just in the moment, but rather you're taking into account that this here moment in time is just a small, infinitesimal time in the eternity we will all have, because this is indeed the beginning of an eternal career. God has put a piece of himself within each of us, a divine fragment of infinity that has a life plan for each of us. We're born on this nativity sphere, but this struggle and difficulty and the problems we have here are all designed to give us plenty of decisions to make because it's only by the decisions of what's right or wrong we make throughout our life that our soul grows, that we become human beings of value and worth not only to ourselves, but also to others, the community, and to God. And everything we do here with that perspective is, and what am I doing, what, I, what am I doing today that is getting me closer to God and getting others closer to God that I encounter? And so with that beginning, uh, I will first give an account of someone I know who died recently. And because this person knew what comes next, there was no fear whatsoever. In fact, she said, I have lived my life to the full. I have fulfilled the purpose God has set for me. And I am ready to continue on my eternal career by graduating from this earth existence. The hospice nurse was asked subsequently, uh, have you encountered many people that have that perspective? And she said, no, it's unusual. And by knowing like she knew what comes next, it makes it easier for those who care for her as well as herself, of course. And so upon the time of the breath ceasing, at that moment, the guardian angels, the particular guardian angel, has her soul in trust. The body is no longer, obviously, neither is her mind. 
that is gone as well, because you get a new mind when you're resurrected in the next life, and you get a new body when we're resurrected. Now, I think that's something we all like, Paul, wouldn't we? Oh, yeah, definitely. As you get older and you get the aches and pains and, <laughs> you know, but uh, I, I would I would ask you there at that moment. And this is a question I had uh, kind of lined up and I've heard various um, explanations for this from, you know, folks in the Arantia community is that when you're, you're talking about life after death and we have all these experiences or accounts of near-death experiences or deathbed visions where people say they will see the angels or Jesus or a loved one. And they'll say, well, you know, oh, they're here to take me home. I'm going. And, you know, almost like they know when they're departing the body. And some of them will reach out a hand like they're reaching for someone and then, you know, poof, they're gone. So uh, how do how would you explain those accounts where when people uh, are, you know, clinically dead and then they come back, you know, X amount of minutes later and they say, well, I was somewhere else. You know, if the if the mind is, is gone for the moment, you know, the consciousness, what part of us is having that experience or is this something else that's happening? Well, that's a good question, Paul. Uh, these near-death experiences that people encounter have made, the themes are very similar to all of them. They'll see a white light, uh, they'll see Jesus, or they'll see mm -hmm. angels, or they'll see something like, it's all very positive. That indwelling spirit that I referenced before that God has given to each of us, that spirit will take our unique configuration of memories and our whole life and what we relate to and take that actual experience happening for the few moments of death and bring those images and those voices and the whole atmosphere to that person because it's a comfortable atmosphere. In other words, for someone who's, say, like a Hindu, they're not going to want to see Jesus. That's not in their mm -hmm. culture. So the right. spirit within that Hindu will bring a vision of appropriateness to that culture of which that Hindu lived in. So that's mm -hmm. why it's unique to each person because it's according to our culture that we have mm -hmm. lived in and our life. And that's what determines what we see. But the same similar elements of seeing a light, again, seeing personalities, being welcomed by family members, it all has different elements, but they're all similar in that. Right. Um, did, I, did I answer your question there, Paul? Yeah, I, I, I certainly think that you did. And, uh, you know, you, you were talking like after... Uh, after we die in this world, we're resurrected in the next. So, uh, you know, we're, we're going to jump off into that aspect of, of life after death. And also, maybe you could tell us if that's something that's instantaneous, we die and we're instantly resurrected in the next life, or it's something that takes a little time. And uh, some people, you know, there's folks that are traditional Christians that listen to my show and they'll say, well, I don't know about that. That, that sounds a little funky, but uh, you know, not really because there are a lot of mainstream Bible scholars who have talked about this heavenly body not made with human hands in heaven that Paul talks about. And they've said, what is that? And if we have a body made in heaven, once we leave this earth, uh, are we really going to be resurrected or connected back with the physical body that's six feet under down on planet earth? So th these are not uh, wonky, uh, as some people would say, new age, uh, you know, scholars. Uh, these are some pretty uh, heavy duty mainstream scholars that have talked about these kind of things in the past. So, you know, when we're talking about this folks, it's not something that's, uh, new or made up or something that's new age or uh, far out in the weeds, never uh, never thought of in the uh, 
traditional Christian circles. So with that being said, uh, Richard, what, what is this resurrection in heaven? Uh, when does it happen? And uh, what can a person expect? What, what might this uh, experience be like? As I mentioned before, Paul, the, our guardian angel have uh, trust of our soul, our immortal soul. And that soul is the repository of all the decisions we made of right and wrong, the spiritual choice of values we've made throughout our life. He safeguards that. And that's the nucleus of our new being. And there's an actual resurrection uh, hall in the next life, physical building, because everything's physical up there, just like it is down here. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have a team that will assemble the different elements of ourselves, the soul with all its memories uh, of value. And then we get a new mind. Uh, there's an actual physical body made of what they call marantia substance or substance that's suitable for the next higher level, uh, vibratory level, compared to this lower, denser plane. And so we get that physical body. We have a mind that goes with it, and that's a beautiful mind. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the senses are so much heightened, and the depth. And uh, our soul is put back in, then our personality uh, puts it all together, and that personality is who we actually are. That's a, uh, a spirit pattern that God the Father himself has given to each of us, that spirit pattern. And it's our eternal purpose, because each of us in the next life have a purpose that only we can fulfill with all the myriad angelic beings and other wonderfully high personalities, yet each of us is something that only we can do, and that God's mind and his eternal plan, he said, ah, Paul, I have something only for you, and this life is the very beginning of getting to it. So, so that personality seizes control of all the different elements that I've been talking about, and all of a sudden you wake up, and there, people are so amazed. It's like, oh, where am I? You know, especially people who are not sure if there's any life after death or don't even believe it. Even atheists, mm -hmm. they're shocked. Holy smoke, there really is something here. <laughs> and, they're, and they're guardian angels who have been with them throughout their life. They're right there. And uh, they give them a hand up off the resurrection table. And then they bring them out. And they bring them to their residence where they're going to uh, temporarily reside. And uh, they, oh, they have questions, of course. And one of the one, first things they do after they first get their initial uh, feet on the ground, as it were, is they get 10 days to take a look at the registry to see who has gone before them that they want to meet. Parents, grandparents, brothers, children. Oh, and the reunions there, Paul, are just uh, delicious, um, mm -hmm. where loved ones have seen one another. And of course, they're asking questions. Pop! there you are. Tell me about this. What's going on? I can't hardly believe it. I didn't think there really was anything. And of course, they continue on. And this is just the very, very beginning. But let me go back to one of your questions about time. Uh, from the time of death, uh, I'll, I'll explain it this way. I told you that the guardian angel has the soul in trust. Now that angel has to actually traverse to the mansion worlds where the resurrection takes place. From a physical universe distance, from this earth to that mansion world, it takes five light years to get there. Excuse me, 15 light years to get there. It's a, it's a bit technical. The mm -hmm. angels, they traverse space at a, three times the speed of light. So that 15 light years requires five actual years to get there. So from the time we die to the time we're resurrected is five years. Now, not everybody is resurrected within the five years. 
Uh, it depends upon your attitude towards God in this life. Those who have achieved a high level of a relationship with God and the cosmos, they're the ones that get resurrected in five years. Otherwise, you have to wait to what they call as a dispensational resurrection. For example, uh, when Adam and Eve came, that was a dispensational resurrection. Everybody who had died before then got resurrected at the same time. When Jesus came, there was another one, a dispensational resurrection. So, and there will be another one when there is another son like Jesus who comes, which, by the way, I speculate will be within two to 300 years. <laughs> it's off, off topic, but I thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> <laughs> a, a topic for another day, the, the yeah. mystery revealed. <laughs> um, um, so the, the Arantia book pretty much um, spells out that Mostly every person, I mean, there, there will be some who, uh, you know, it refers to uh, immediately will not want to have eternal survival or do the will of God, so they will just cease to be. Um, there is no hell, there's no eternal torment, which, again, you know, the, if you go back, some people might say, well, no, you know, there, there, there's hell, there's, there's the lake of fire and all that, but Again, we've had mainstream scholars uh, talk about this idea of annihilation, you know, e eternal destruction. Like when you look back in the Old Testament, when there was a wicked king or, you know, a kingdom and uh, it was destroyed through war. And it would say, you know, that the smoke of their destruction rises for all eternity. Well, those cities, those kingdoms aren't still there smoldering. It's symbolic. That smoke is symbolic that, you know, the smoke of their destruction is forever, but it's, it's you know, a allegory. So a lot of scholars have said, well, you know, um, this hell or Sheol or the grave, which we have uh, sadly translated hell in uh, uh, most of our, well, all of our, our modern Bibles, uh, it might be something that's uh, a little bit misleading and uh, perhaps mixed with the pagan Roman idea of the underworld. So again, the idea of, you know, just annihilation ceasing to be, not choosing God, but choosing, hey, I want to do my own thing. I, I don't want to follow the plan of God. I, I, I don't want to, uh, you know, as Dante would say, better, better to serve in hell a rule in hell than to serve in heaven type of attitude. So uh, those people would, you know, pretty quickly, uh, you know, cease to be. But for most of us, and, you know, what to say that most people, you know, we, that we possibly can't understand everything about God and eternity here. And to be patient with ourselves, because there's much we will learn in the next life. So when we wake up in that resurrection hall, you know, this is, um, a progressive ascension where, where we continue to learn and go to different schools and even unlearn some things that we were taught here. And the Urantia book talks about the mansion worlds where Jesus in the New Testament said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. So tell us a little bit about this uh, mansion world journey, the progression of the soul as it grows and evolves and becomes more spiritual and even more, uh, I guess, as the, the Bible would say, you know, more like the angels in heaven. So what are these mansion worlds and uh, what kind of journey is this going to be? You know, what, what do we know about it? What, what are we looking to become in the ages of, you know, eternity once we leave this earth? Uh, Jesus said, in my house, there are many mansions. And to be specific, there are seven mansion worlds. We're resurrected on the first one. And the first two are basically uh, remedial education. It's like going to college and you really just haven't gotten it all together uh, in uh, high school. And so you have to go get remedial education so you can get on with the program. Well, we all are going to go into the next life with psychological and social deficits psychological problems, don't know how to get along with people. And, you, and just 
you cannot get too far in heaven if you don't know how to get along with people. Make sense? <laughs> and same thing with the serious psychological issues people have. That's all going to be dealt with. Now, they have what I would term as like a, a divine psychologists, the angels. And they work with us. And those first two worlds designed to get rid of everything out of us that's unsuitable for the heavenly life. Now, this is the time where people will make the decision, Paul, as you had uh, alluded to or taught, spoke about, whether they want to really have a life with God or not with themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I know for me, it's been very difficult because I love God to think of why, how could somebody in the next life where they see all the beauty and what's going on ever say, I don't want to go on with God. I don't want it. Uh, and the self-life is so prominent where once they recognize there is a God, the attitude basically is get off my back. Mm -hmm. Nobody's in control of me but me. I've got liberty, a manifesto of liberty, and I'm num numeral, numeral one, and nobody tells me what to do. Well, when that attitude is cemented, Paul, that's when they have basically decided, I will make all my own decisions and have no reference to the cosmos, to God's plan to other people and what's good for them. It's only what's good for me. So each time that decision is cemented, their soul gets emptied out. Every time they make a decision for self and against God, one more piece of their soul is destroyed until mm -hmm. eventually the temple within in which that indwelling spirit lives, there's no room and the spirit has to leave. Mm -hmm. And when that spirit of God leaves because there's no more room, that's when annihilation essentially takes place because there's nothing there real. It's an empty husk. Yes, mm -hmm. you have mental circuits. That's why on this earth, where uh, I don't think too many people actually have no God enough to reject him to actually elect annihilation on this earth. But if they should then all that's resurrected into next life is an empty shell because there's nothing mm. left and there it's judged. And they are as if they had not been Paul. That's mm. it. And because imagine having a loving father, God, having a hell. Who are the angels going to be there? Uh, angel, who wants to be the warden? <laughs> you know, and who wants to be reminded of all the terrible things that happen with people that don't know God and don't love God. You don't want that. Loving father doesn't want that. Free will ultimately is the choice. Do we go on with God or without? You cannot <clears throat> and you cannot continue if you reject God. So that's what annihilation is, is about, Paul. And I think, um, you know, for, for people that uh, everybody has the uh, the apps on TV where the, you know, Netflix, if you go on epics, I, I believe it's epics. They have uh, a category of movies called, uh, you know, faith and inspiration. And there's a movie entitled, it's a funny name, but it's, it's called hell and Mr. Fudge or Mr. Fudge and hell. And it's actually about uh, a minister uh, I, I believe his name was Edward Fudge, who, through reading the Bible, you know, uh, came upon this idea that, you know, he didn't think hell was eternal. And uh, I think he's still alive. And, and, and the the argument that he put forth, you know, for annihilation rather than, you know, burning forever and tormenting, you know, because God is merciful. He's not going to you know, have souls uh, being barbecued for all eternity. So hell and Mr. Fudge might be an inter interesting place for some people to start and maybe take it from there. And I make these references because, you know, there are people that, as I said, watch the show that are more traditional Christians, and I'm very cognizant of that. And coming out of a fundamentalist background years ago, I understand how, 
conversations like this can be very uncomfortable. Like, oh my God, no, you know, you're, you're wrong. This, this, this is uh, demonic. It's a lie. It's deception. But no, you know, a lot of people don't, they don't have the references nor have been given the references or even the education to know that these things, even in traditional Christianity, are things that have been talked about since the beginning. And so the Urantia book isn't, uh, as I've said, you know, different times in this show, it's not making up something new. But, you know, what it's telling us it does is kind of explaining and expanding on uh, the revelation of the Bible that we have you know, making it, uh, you know, kind of fine tuning some of these things that people have been confused about or fought about for centuries, you know, so uh, take heart friends, we're not, uh, we're not here trying to, you know, slip you the, the devil's message type of thing, <laughs> you know, there's, there's information out there that, uh, you know, you, you can certainly study these things yourself. But, um, Again, when it when it comes to the mansion worlds, uh, I, I find it interesting that if you study a lot of near death experiences, and again, this is something that goes, uh, you know, way back over the years since these things have been, you know, written down and recorded. When you talk about the angels, you know, um, ministering to people, giving them uh, divine psychology, as you put it. There are so many accounts of people who say during the near-death experience that, you know, the angels, the guides that were with them before they, they came back, you know, to their earthly body, who saw this. They said, you know, I, I, I never thought of this, but they, they were showing me these, these buildings almost like, uh, you know, rest homes or, you know, not like we would have, but something, you know, very comfortable and, and people being, you know, their soul being healed, you know, whether it's going through, uh, you know, some kind of um, mentoring or uh, what's the word I'm looking for, counseling to get rid of a lot of pain and, and, and you know, fear or whatever it was they, they carried here on earth. So, Again, the, these are things I, I started studying the near-death experience probably um, early, early-ish 1990s. And, you know, I didn't start reading the Arantia book until um, five, six years ago. So, you know, my path, you know, I've come across a lot of things that I read in there and I go, oh, you know, oh, I've heard that before or I've thought of that before, but I never read it anywhere else. So it's, it's, it's very interesting in that, um, in that regard, you know, that it seems to confirm a lot of things for uh, a lot of people, but go going through the mansion worlds, going through this progress of the soul, this growth, what is it that we are ultimately becoming? What, what, what is our, our ultimate destiny, according to the Arantia book. Now, it doesn't tell us everything, but it gives us a bit of a hint on, you know, where we're going and what we will be eventually in the afterlife. Uh, Paul, I think you hit the nail on the head with that question, because what we are beginning now, continuing in the mansion worlds, and then postgraduate from mansion worlds, is to making our human divine. Mm -hmm. Think about that. We're beginning right now when we're human. We start so far from divinity, but yet by the decisions we make and the choices we choose, our, what was only human becomes more and more like God, more and more divine. And that's the purpose of this life, is to initiate that eternal journey of becoming like God. It is written, be ye perfect as I am perfect. Wow. That's pretty heavy. Well, mm. Now, God is not so unwise and unkind as to drop us down into this life and say, okay, go do it. 
uh, I think deism basically says, yeah, there is a God, but then he leaves us on our own. Yeah. Yeah. Not true. A loving father would never leave his cherished children on their own. There's a plan for us. And that plan begins with giving a piece of himself to live within us that create that immortal soul. And the soul it continues on, gets clothed with a new body and new mind, as we discussed already. And in the mansion worlds, we're going to see buildings, and you have sky, and you have transportation. And it says, well, wait a minute. That's what it's like down here. How can it be like that up there? What this is like down here is a reflection of what is up there already. We are, as Plato talked about, the shadow of the reality. And so, for example, we enjoy traveling in this life. Well, yeah, they have travel in the next life. So you have excursions from the mansion worlds where they'll take individuals or groups and they'll actually go uh, with transport seraphim and they'll transport them to the main headquarters world of the system. And they go, oh, my goodness, holy smoke, look at that. We were taught about this, but look, we're seeing it. So they have travel down there. They have recreation. They'll have like uh, pageants or plays or movies, equivalent to movies. Uh, mm -hmm. Because life up there is divided into three main areas. One is education. Uh, so I hope everybody that's going to die, well, everybody will die, but everyone anticipates dying that if you're not a good student here, you will become one up there. And believe it or not, you will enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. The second is work. You're always doing something. It's like uh, education is like uh, you learn and then you put into practice. You go out and you work and you do. You help the angels and you have different jobs you do. And the third is basically rest and refreshing. And that's where the recreation comes in. Uh, Now, Paul, I have, at the beginning of my book, I have uh, questions and answers that are very common. And I, I don't know if that's something we want to cover any of that or, or not. Uh, yeah, read a couple of those off, you know, ones that catch you that you think here's most one that, people listening. Yeah. Here's one. I have some personal experience. <clears throat> Does dementia affect your experience after death? So, and that's a big problem, dementia, Alzheimer's these days. And in fact, I was my, the caregiver for my brother for about 10 years or so. Uh, so I know firsthand uh, what that's like. And I could see with my brother that his ability to make moral decisions, what's right or what's wrong, vanished. It was beyond him. And because the soul is the creation of those decisions of right and wrong, once there's no longer mental capacity to make those decisions, the indwelling spirit leaves. There's nothing more for it to do here. Mm -hmm. So now the body continues on, but the soul is basically arrested in growth. Mm -hmm. it's taken care of, but it's not going to grow anymore. And it's just a question of time for the physical body to expire. And I remember speaking to a woman whose husband had dementia, Alzheimer's, and uh, I was explaining this concept about, in a way, divorcing yourself in spirit from the one you love and you're caring for. Now, that may seem harsh, but I did this with my brother because once I recognized there's nobody in there there's no more soul being built. He can't make those decisions. I wouldn't allow myself to be drawn into his dramas. And, they, and with dementia, they get increasingly bizarre in the behavior. Yeah. Uh, and I wouldn't let myself, I, consider, I treated him like I would a stranger, as it were. So the emotional uh, harm that could have been done to me, I prevented it by divorcing myself in spirit, as I call it. Mm -hmm. And I tried to explain that to the woman, but it was too hard for her. You know, and right. that's, people, you know, say loved ones, 
and then they get all their buttons get pull, pushed and their life as a caregiver becomes very difficult. And then recognizing that that person will again live and you will see them in the next life. Wow. Now that makes it really easy to just care for their body and their mind, whatever's left of it until they're mm -hmm. gone. Um, so I, I do want to mention that because it, so many people are dealing with that and it's so hard for caregivers and this will make it easier if they could recognize uh, what I'm talking about. Yeah, I, I think it's a good point because, and, and I've often thought of, you know, something like that too. And I, and I saw it with my mother, you know, think of yourself when like you're really sick with something like the flu, you know, and you know, you're tired, you're, you're, you know, your, your mind just isn't quite right. What happens if somebody comes in, you know, you're, you're laying in your bed, you know, you, you feel like hell on earth and somebody, Hey, Richard, well, you know, here you are the 103, you know, you got the flu. Uh, let's get into some real, you know, in-depth conversations and, you know, you just can't go there. And so, you know, when you're thinking of some people, you know, whether they're in advanced stages of cancer or dementia or, you know, diseases that really debilitate them physically and mentally, I, I think we have to start to, you know, to understand that, you know, they're, they're, they're not running at full capacity mentally or spiritually and make a little leeway for that and, and not take it so harshly when we see, like you said, the dramas or sometimes they, uh, I was doing a uh, spiritual counseling with a lady, you know, uh, a few weeks ago, and she was really upset that her best friend who was older than her, you know, got Alzheimer's and she was in a nursing home and she went to see her and, you know, just said she was the sweetest lady, but she goes in to visit her and she like yells at her and calls her the, the most horrible, you know, swearing, cursing names, you know, and how hurtful this was. And uh, I, I did the same thing. I kind of explained uh, a little bit what we're talking about here. And it, it was somewhat helpful. She still had to kind of, uh, you know, get a little bit, bit of a grasp on that. But I, I think it is helpful to realize that the person isn't operating 100%. And like you said, we have to continue to love them, but divorce ourselves from that um, behavior and the dramas because it's it's just not them you know everything is starting to as you said shut down and the the physical body's getting ready to you know uh pass away so yeah that that's a good one that, that's a really good point to bring up i want to uh, segue from what you're talking about when you're not at your best and mm -hmm. how not to expect other people to rise to the occasion if they're under the weather knowing mm -hmm. that their body is taking so much of their uh, attention. Well, uh, the last couple of days, I was not quite under the weather, but I wasn't myself. So as is my habit, you know, I commune with God, say, okay, how should I deal with this? Because I feel the pressures of just not being quite right. And so God said to me, this is a splendid opportunity to maintain connection with me because when your body is not cooperating, your mind is drawn downward, it's not upward. So when you have like, it's like wearing weights on your ankles and walking. It's mm -hmm. like you have to maintain uh, balance and forward motion and it's really forceful. So uh, being under the weather is a great opportunity to strive upward and maintain that connection and be nice. You know, if you have, a, if it's really bad, if you're in a hospital or a similar situation, be gracious to your caregivers and your loved ones. Uh, that's really a test because when the pain is intense, all you want to do is yell and lash out and so forth. Uh, I heard of a gentleman who was 76 or five when he died. And the account of the nurses was they never met a gentleman like this because he, had, he was just welcoming the next life 
and he was a pleasure to be around, regardless of what are the physical ailment that caused his death. And that's the way it should be for all of us, Paul. Just it's like, no matter what the hurt to the body is, we maintain a connection because we know where we're going. Mm -hmm. It's it's no different than like, honey, go down to the store and get a loaf of bread. It's like, okay, well, you know the store, you know you're going to get there, you know you're going to come back. Well, we know the way also to the next life. We know what's going to happen when we get there, and we can know more of it to the degree we want to, because the spirit of truth in us always will tell us what is. Uh, from a youth, I wanted to know if there's anything beyond this life. I never even knew God existed. But because I wanted to know, that's why I have become familiar with the life after this one. And anybody who wants to know that, God will give it to them. You know, if you ask for bread, God will not give you a stone. Mm -hmm. So all that is very uh, readily aware information. And then life after death experience, it was just dra dramatizations of it. But you don't need that to change your life. Once you get a revelation, God is that real in your life. And why you're here is to make your human divine by every decision you're making of moral import. Well, then that's the equivalent of a near-death experience and why their lives gets changed afterwards and our lives can be changed without having such a dramatic experience. Yeah, and it, it, it certainly helps to, I, I've said for years because I grew up in a household where I had certain relatives that were just petrified of death and disease when the family would get together they just perseverate and then that type of thing this person's dying this person has cancer this person in our church is now dead oh my god he was so young you know and as i got older i you know i started to question is that that really the way to be you know in such dread and fascination over these types of things and um you know, I, I, I'd like to think that when I'm on my deathbed, I'll be one of those peaceful people because I, I, I really uh, have a strong faith and, and belief and even a knowing of, of what awaits me. You know, I've, you know, I've had experiences in my life that, uh, you know, can't be explained in the, uh, the material human level. So, you know, I think especially in our Western culture, you know, we, we fear and mourn so much when it comes to death that that's something we we need to get past, you know, and I've always, it always really bothered me when, when somebody passes and they say, oh, he, oh, he or she is gone. We're, I'm never going to see them again, you know, and I would always say if I'm in the presence, I'd say, well, are you sure about that? You know, <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I'll see him in heaven. Well, then, you know, don't, don't let yourself, uh, you know, get so tied up in those kind of uh, burdensome, morbid thoughts, because that, that only makes it worse for you, you know? In fact, it's a wonderful graduation to be released from this body for so many people because of the pain and the difficulty in this, you know. Uh, we were not designed to die with such chronic diseases. That's another mm -hmm. subject, but we don't have to. We could die with our full faculties and our full strength when it's our time. I think it was Jacob, uh, who gathered his sons around him. And he may have, he was full of years. I don't know if he was 120, but he got, it was his time. And he put his feet up upon the couch and he gave up the ghost. And that's the way, to me, that's the way it should be. It's like, embrace it. It's a graduation. When you go to a graduation, you're happy. Mm -hmm. no? Yeah, and again, you, you even have a lot of, um you know, mainstream Christians and scholars who look at uh, Paul when he was at the end of his life. And he said he would, he was caught between the two, whether to stay or whether to depart, you know? So there's, there's that question in, you know, theological circles of, Hey, do we, do we have a say in this, you know, when, when we're ready, you know, type of thing, not just, uh, God appoints while you're going to die, uh, you know, March 2nd, uh, 2030, and, and that's it. You know, uh, you know, we, we might have a little bit of a, a say in, in how we go and, and, and maybe even when. So that's also a, a very interesting topic. But as I look at the old clock, I see we're, uh, we're running down on podcast time here. So I want to say, Richard, this was 
an awesome conversation. I appreciate you uh, taking time, you know, out of your schedule to to do the show this week. And uh, I hope folks out there enjoyed it and got something uh, out of it that makes them think and uh, increases their faith and their relationship with God uh, a little bit to make this crazy life uh, we live a little more bearable and, and, and make uh, a little or a lot more sense. <laughs> uh, well said. Thank you for the invitation. And may all your words come to pass in the people's lives that who are listening. Absolutely. And, and you have a lot of different books out. So hopefully we can do this again, uh, you know, in the future and talk about one of the other uh, topics that you have out there. You have uh, a lot of interesting books. I haven't read them yet because I, I read a book by one author, then I go to another, then another, then I go back to the, you know, but you're coming within the next one to two books. Another one of your titles is coming up. So, <laughs> uh, Paul, I mentioned one of the more popular books is Healthy Living. Uh, mm -hmm. and that has it has to do with uh, alternative health and your spiritual nature, mm -hmm. because people have such dread of disease this day with the COVID and all that, everything else. It's not called for, even though it's out there. But my book addresses that. So uh, something you may want to put your attention towards uh, if you have a personal interest in that. I do, and I, and I just got the um, the Kindle version. Uh, and I'm probably going to get the paperback. I like to have, uh, you know, a hard copy of, uh, you know, books of, you know, personal uh, deeper interest in my library. Because who knows, the grid could go down one day and then all your books are gone. So, uh, folks, don't throw away your paperbacks. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're right about that, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, Richard, thanks for doing the show. Really appreciate it. And uh, all of you listening out there, thank you for listening. And uh, I'll see you again next week here on the Ascension Podcast. God bless. Mm -hmm.